so many people who I took karate with as a kid that reach out to me now and they're like, man, I wish I would have stuck with it. I wish I would have just kept doing it. I miss it so much. Hey there, you're tuned into Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio, episode 598. My guest today is Sensei Seth Adams. I am Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for Martial Arts Radio, founder of Whistle Kick, and I love martial arts. And that's why everything we do at Whistle Kick is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you're interested in what we're doing to that end, hop over to whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's also the easiest way to find the stuff that we sell because, yeah, we got to pay bills to make this thing happen. And you can save yourself a little bit of money. Help us know that the work that we're doing leads to a sale here and there once in a while, maybe a little more frequently than that. Podcast 15 gets you 15% off. Now, the show, it has its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Longtime listeners know if you go to that website, you're going to find a lot of really cool stuff. And if you're not checking that out, you're not getting the full experience of the show. You're not getting everything that you could out of what the guests are sharing with us. The show comes out twice a week. And the whole reason that we do it, well, we're working hard to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists worldwide. If you want to help the show and the work that we do, you can do a number of things. Make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media, tell a friend, pick up a book, leave a review, or support us on Patreon. Now, if you think the shows that we're putting out are worth 63 cents a pop, not even a dollar, 63 cents, consider supporting us on Patreon for $5 a month. And if you do, you're actually going to get a bonus episode so that 63 cents is even lower. We have very, very few people who stop their Patreon contributions. Why? Because we flood you with values. The whole premise of what we do at Whistlekick. We're going to give you a bunch of stuff. You give us a little bit of money. We give you even more stuff. You can't beat it. There's no better deal out there. Show me a better deal. You won't. You can't. It doesn't exist. Speaking of a good deal, I had a good deal of fun. Hey, there's a transition for you with Sensei Seth. If you know this guy, if you know the content that he puts out, you know that he's he's charming, he's positive, he's fun, and he's built quite the reputation by doing those things and being a solid martial artist all at the same time. Well, I was absolutely honored that he said yes when we invited him to come on the show, and here he is. It's a wonderful conversation. Had a blast. We get into some some cool stuff, some crazy stuff, some stuff you'd expect, and stuff that you wouldn't. So let's do it. Sensei Seth, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. What is up? How you doing? Doing great. How about yourself? Oh, I'm fantastic. Fantastic, Wonderful. spectacular. That's not. You're not. You're not leaving much room for it to get better. I can only bring you down oh. from here. I don't know how I feel. Oh about well, that. you know, I, uh, I've got a little <laughs> crick in my neck. <laughs> All right, we're getting better. We're getting better. You're leaving some space. I appreciate that. Yes. Did you have anybody growing up that first thing in the morning? Remember back when you were? Maybe you didn't take a school bus. I took a school bus. I had this one friend and it was, we were far enough from the high school that it was dark part of the year when we were picked up and he would get on mm-hmm. the bus and he was just beaming. And of course, you know, teenagers were all like, Arr! and he was just yeah. so excited for life. And everybody just, no, we, we need to build through the day. We can't start here with you. Cause there's, there's only down. Yeah. Right. Where else, where else do you go from there? Yeah. No, I, I, uh, I, I also lived about 30 minutes away from the school uh but but my mom drove me i had a bunch of siblings so it was we pretty much had our own bus oh nice but i just slept i was i was <laughs> that was me any i pretty much got ready to fall asleep again and then i would re-get ready once i got to school i get it i get it yeah we we were we were depending on the bus route which changed from time to time at least 45 minutes sometimes an hour wow yeah, yeah rural That's maine crazy. how it goes <laughs> how it goes now we're not here to talk about uh well some some aspects of childhood but a little more focused than what happened on buses or school transportation or sleep habits i was, say, I was kind of hoping this was going to be a fully bus podcast <laughs> it would I'm be a, a first down now but it's fine it, I it guess. would be first yeah <laughs> i i don't could how much content could you fill talking about school buses i i think i might tap out in about 10 minutes i think anything less than an hour would be a bust <laughs> it's Oh. <laughs> so right now with that single statement everyone either got really excited or they or just or they turned it off rolled their eyes back into their to their ears somewhere it. i love it 
I, I, I love when we get somebody on who's got personality and is a la- is is willing to just let it fly. They're practiced with it. And, you know, of course, there are people listening who who know who you are because of things that you do. And, you know, this is that's surprising. This is kind of your style, Honestly. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I would say it's my, more my style. You know, dad jokes, puns, you know, martial arts that is designed to be mostly just funny. Mm. What's your best martial arts pun that you're willing to to open up with here? Hmm, my best one? martial arts or, pun? Or joke. You know, uh, I don't even necessarily have specific jokes designed for martial arts. Like, I don't, like, obviously, like, there's the pork chop one. Everybody knows the pork chop one. I don't know the pork chop one. I almost don't even want to say it. Oh, now you if, have to. I, I don't know this one. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. What's the pig's best karate technique? <laughs> okay. Pork the pork chop. chop. Yeah, of all course. Right. Uh, I, all right, fine. That'll, that's my best one. I'll just leave it at it's that. It's solid. It's, <laughs> you know, you know what I like about dad jokes that that sort of humor. It's approachable and mm-hmm. almost universally received. Very few mm-hmm. people yeah. think they are the the height of comedy, but mm-hmm. everyone kind of will will smile. And go, all right. You know, you yeah, get a little okay. bit of a chuckle, and so we can all share in that there's there's some humor there and, you know, some well, non... The best part about them is even when they're bad, they're still good yeah. because of how bad they were. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's, it, you're, you've got it, that collaboration there. K- kind of like a really yeah. bad uh, martial arts movie. Mm, yeah. We love them yeah, very similar. because they're, and despite their poor quality badness yeah awful alley yeah right if we're gonna make up it's so bad it's good exactly yep exactly well let's go back let's okay let's roll back we're hitting rewind on the vcr that is your life and if we Mm -hmm. press play we're gonna see the first connection that you have to martial arts whether that's your first class or maybe you watched movies or, or or a friend or whatever it is so i press play what do we see of you as your first connection to the arts? Uh, so my parents both taught me from a super young age. You know, uh, mom and dad opened a dojo before I was even born. And then if you press play, you would probably find me like running around naked somewhere in the dojo while my parents are trying to like scoop me up and put me back in the back office. My Yeah, so for me, <laughs> it's been pretty much lifelong in the dojo at some point. Uh, my dad taught me throughout pretty much until I was around 18. Uh, I played sports in between. So like there was years off and there was, you know, time off and stuff like that. But for the most part, I mean, it has been karate ingrained into my system since, since probably I was, I mean, could walk really. Mm. What's your earliest memory of karate? Hmm. My earliest memory of karate would probably have to be, we would have these like sleepovers in the dojo. Mm. My dad would make pancakes in the morning, but mostly the most important part was we would, we would watch Three Ninjas and Warriors of Virtue as soon as it got dark. I think that was the, the first thing that I can remember was watching those stellar martial arts movies. Mm. What was your what was your first favorite martial arts movie? It's got to be Three Ninjas. Easy. Really? Three Ninjas okay. and specifically Three Ninjas High Noon to Mega Mountain, mm. which is the worst one. <laughs> Why that one then? I don't know. (laughs) I really don't know. It's probably because of all the uh, super, super over the top kios, maybe. Mm. But I don't know why that one. That one always just was just one of my favorites. I think it was just so colorful, and it was like at an amusement park, and it had Hulk Hogan. So that's a plus. A huge plus. Huge plus. Yeah. I mean, literally a big person plus. Is is there any industry? that is more self-selective or, or internally argumentative about quality that turns out lower quality cultural representations. We argue amongst ourselves about hmm. the tiniest little nuance, and yet we put out things like Three Ninjas. Like, like Three Ninjas, yeah, right. I would say probably art, to be honest. Like, I'm not super huge into art, but every time I look at art and I hear people talk about it, I'm like, no. That does not look like art, like mm. to the average person. I'm like, that looks like you taped a banana to the wall. Because they did. I mean, literally. How much did literally, that go for? Did. What was that? Oh, 200,000? I, 
I, yeah, it was something crazy, was something, something absolutely ridiculous. But yeah, no, I, I'd say anything that's like, well, what, what happens is that when you don't use martial arts, it literally just turns into art for most people. Mm. And I guess that makes sense because the, the less you use it, the more you're just looking at it or performing it or creating it. So then it becomes like, you know, biased towards different people's opinions, the creators, the people who enjoy it, the people who don't enjoy it. I guess that makes sense, right? It does. The more I talk about it. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. All right, so you, you grow up, you, you you start running around, and, and, and I'm just, I'm I'm laughing at the, the naked running around the dojo because I've witnessed this multiple times. <laughs> multiple children, multiple dojos. Mm-hmm. So I can I can appreciate that. Yeah. And you're kind of brought up along. Now, at some point along the way, you become old enough to form your own opinions of whether or not this is a thing that you're either going to do or depending on the parents, either not do or regretfully, resentfully do. Mm -hmm. And quite often when we talk about, excuse me, children who grow up being immersed in something from an incredibly young age, because it's something the parents are very passionate about. They reject it. Mm -hmm. Did you reject it and then come back later? Or have you been in from the beginning? Yeah, no, I definitely had a moment. So when I when I was growing up, like I took karate, but I was I was going to play professional football. <laughs> so so like ha- my dad's side, you know, my dad was the the karate teacher after a certain point, and my mom's side, uh, my uncle, my grandfather played football. So it was like this constant back and forth of what was I going to do. And then I was like, well, football can get me into college. Football can maybe pay bills someday. You know, karate, it's a little more difficult because kind of the only option at the time for karate was to open a school. That was kind of it. You know, like the odds of becoming like the other options are maybe a movie star. Like that's really the only two options. Like there's either you run a dojo or it's like something crazy like that. So I was like, ah, let's go football. So I went, there was probably, I think I had quit once when I was a teenager for maybe a year. You know, after you take it for like 10 years, Mm -hmm. you feel like you kind of know everything, especially when you're a teenager. You definitely feel like you know everything. Those exact words, yeah. Yeah. So that led to one quitting, and my dad was like, okay, you know, that's, I get it. And then I came back maybe a year later. And then I took it until I was maybe 18. And then once I turned 18, I got my second degree black belt. And I was like, okay, I, I just couldn't. So then I moved to undergrad, played football in undergrad. And then, you know, obviously couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't do anything else other than get knocked in the head by large people. Uh, and then funny enough, I stumbled back into karate when I was in grad school and I was like, what am I going to do for work? You know, like nothing, none of this stuff that I do is fun. That's in school. I was like, I wish I could just teach karate. And I was like, Oh, I got, I guess I could, I guess I have that option. And that's how I kind of got back into it, Hmm. uh, in a different time frame. So there's two main times that I stopped and then restarted. That first time that you stopped, you said you were I don't think you said your age, but you stopped for a year. Yeah. How old were you when that happened? Oh, man. Somewhere between probably like 11 and 13, okay. if I had to guess. But I don't remember exactly. Okay. Which is a common age for people to step out of martial arts. Anybody who runs a school knows that adolescent phase is – there's a huge exodus, especially among martial arts students who have been training for – years what you know Mm -hmm. maybe maybe they've earned a black belt or junior black belt or they're knocking on the door and all of a sudden team sports pop up and they're like oh i'm gonna go do this other thing i'm gonna play soccer or whatever Mm -hmm. but they don't generally come back so that's the part i'm curious of you know a year later you choose to come back why well for me it was a little bit easier because i was still in the dojo because the after school programs because of you know, the fact that that was my dad's job, you know, I, I was always in there. So it was a little bit easier for me to come back because I could see it. All my friends were in the after school program in the dojo and then they were taking class. So I was like, oh, well, I, I can still kick your butts. So <laughs> that kind of led me to join back. And it's funny you mentioned that because there's so many people who I took karate with as a kid that reach out to me now and they're like, man, I wish I would have stuck with it. I wish I would have just kept doing it. 
And like, maybe I even still did it today. I miss it so much. Because once people fall off at that young age, and usually they fall off at a young age, let's be honest, because they think it's not cool anymore, because they right. have other friends who are in group sports who are like, usually have like a quote unquote cooler status mm -hmm. than karate does. And what happens is they just never come back into it because, you know, once you reach that age, you kind of are super heavily influenced by your peers and their thoughts. And then once you become an adult and you realize none of it matters, you're like, oh, I wish I would have kept doing karate. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's an experience that has occurred many many times. I, it's something that I I'm surprised at. And even in in Cobra Kai, I'm assuming you've seen Cobra Kai. They of course hint at that some of these kids are popular in the wider demographics of the school. And I'm saying that 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 didn't happen. I uh -uh. did not witness that. Now, of course, I only grew up once and went to one high school and trained in one then dojo, mm -hmm. but there was, was no situation where advertising the fact that you did martial arts was anything other than pushing you down a few rungs on the social ladder. Yeah, right. Yeah, no, one of the biggest mistakes I made <laughs> when I was, so uh, freshman, like football orientation, 110 of these big burly dudes were in this room and everybody, all the freshmen had to walk up and say one interesting thing about themselves. Mm which is a nightmare. And I was like, Oh my gosh, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? Literally like three days prior, I'd gotten my second degree. And sure enough, I walk up to the front of the room and I say, uh, yeah, my name is Seth. Uh, I recently got my second degree black belt in karate and everybody, I, I could just feel them. Like nobody laughed out loud, but I could, I could feel it. And going back now, I'm like, ha ha. That's this is what you get now. Half of you work in, you know, I, I don't know, somewhere that isn't as cool as what I do. So sucks to be you. <laughs> right. right. I, I get that. I get it. And now I'm curious because when I when I talk to people who are teenagers in martial arts or, or were teenagers actively training in martial arts, I, I throw myself in this group. There mm -hmm. were quite a few people who would maybe quietly, maybe behind their back, maybe to their face laugh at them, ridicule them, et cetera. Again, you know, kind of the, the bully pushing down sort of thing. But yeah. there seems to be far less initiation of physical violence among those, mm -hmm. in, in those circumstances. Because at the same time, they're ridiculing, but they're also apprehensive about testing the skill. Was that your experience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was always a bigger guy. People never really were like super pushy on wanting to get into physical mm. altercations with me in the first place. But people were definitely like, you think you could, like you always get the question. You think you could beat me up since you take karate? Is that what, is that what it is? Do you think you could beat me up? I get that all the time. Um, but very rarely are people like, Hey, do you want to spar? <laughs> very rarely do people want to actually do anything about it. I'd say it's probably a fair assessment. Mm. Yeah. I, my, I got that question often. Do you think you can beat me up? Yeah. My answer was always, no, I don't. And that was... I know they, I could. They, they didn't... <laughs> I would just leave it at that because I'm, I'm a small guy. I don't know how, how big you mm. are. I'm 5'7 on a good day. Okay, yeah, yeah. And that just took the wind out of their sails. No, I don't think I can. Because yeah. that's not what they're expecting. Yeah, right. They're expecting that, that I'm going to have as much insecure ego come through in my words as they have in theirs. And I don't know. I can spell yeah, right. better well, than you. That I could do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know that I enjoy my time. That's cool. Right. And they're like, oh, well, I mean, I do too. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, it's weird because there's not really a lot of other things. Like if, if somebody was a painter, like you would be like, I bet I could paint better than you can. <laughs> like, okay. okay. I guess, I guess That's not. That's a great point. <laughs> what, what other thing that people aren't, experienced with do they more generally assume that they're good at than combat the only the only thing that i've seen frequently is like women's sports but but it's it's like dudes talking about women's sports mm. like it's spe specifically baseball to softball many times i've seen and heard conversations where people are like oh you play softball i bet i could bet i could hit a home run off you it's like okay Have you watch those girls pitch <laughs> Yeah, right. Those are <laughs> from super close too. 
that 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 but yeah that's a, that's the only other time i see it you you don't really see it too many other times other than fighting like there's this weird human instinct or thing to like make regular non-training humans think that they're good at fighting where do you think that there's comes nothing from? else is that is that innate or is that learned culturally i would imagine it has something to do with like natural uh, like need for dominance that would be my guess because it's the one thing that you like don't necessarily have to prove if you talk about mm-hmm. it uh, unless the other person wants to do that like you could be like oh i'm actually really smart and you'd be like really okay let's test that out like that's really easy to test out for the most part but fighting you'd be like i'm a really good fighter you don't necessarily want to fight right then and there like you don't nec- you, i might not have my shorts on like my shoes might not be ready to kick yeah. It's it's hard to test that out immediately. Right. Right. And of course, even if you are victorious, there are still mm-hmm. maybe severe consequences. And oh yeah, people, absolutely. I, I think yeah, on right. some level get that. And that's why when we when we think about the typical teenage high school fight, it usually involves a bunch of other people piling on, encouraging it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It makes you feel like those things happen from feeling like you have to, to like secure your place, you know? All right. I've only been, I've only been in one fight, like one human with human fight. And that was in middle school. I think I was like one of those very hormonal testosterone teenage boys. You could argue that I didn't start it, but you also could maybe argue that I did. Oh, interesting. I was playing basketball with my buddies on the uh, bad basketball players court. There's like a good basketball players court and there's a bad one. I was on the bad one. Mm-hmm. And we were playing and I guess I was just having a bad day. And then this could, kid took our ball and just started running around with it, dribbling it. And I was like, okay, we're in the middle of a game. I'm a very competitive person. So I went over to kick the ball out of his hands and I might have kicked him in the face. I might have kicked the ball, which hit him in the face. I'm not, I, I'm still not super clear on that. And I don't think he was either. Anyway, foot made contact with something. And then he got up, punched me in the face. I pushed him away and we both kind of look at each other in like sort of a half stance. And then it just diffuses. Mm. It's it's done then. Any repercussions? That, that was, um, not for me. Okay. I, I had a super adrenaline dump and, because of all those hormones, I had like a super high and then a super low because I wasn't trying to get into a fight. Right. You know, I just wanted to get the ball back. Um, and then I had like this weird moment that I felt like for the rest of the day, either him or his buddies were going to come up behind me and just punch me in the back of the head. So I went home. I, I was like, I wussed out immediately. I was like, I got in a fight <laughs> and I feel like uh, people are going to come beat me up now. And my grandparents came and picked me up. Wow. My dad was like, well, did you deserve it? And I was like, yeah, probably. And he was like, okay. And all the football coaches like, oh man, I wish I would have seen you beat that kid up. Cause they all know about the karate background. So they're like, oh man, I just wish I could have seen it. I didn't get in any trouble. I don't think he did either. It sounds like it handled itself. Yeah. Yeah. It all fizzled out. I mean, it, it wasn't that big of a deal. It was just like the only time I've ever been outside of like me getting in a scrap with a deer. The only situation I've been in. Uh, um, what? <laughs> <laughs> you, now, now I thought I was going to ask this question as a joke. You said you're only human on human fight, and I was going to say, "Well, what animals have you gotten into a fight with?" And you've kind of taken the wind out of that joke. Uh, a deer? What? <laughs> What's going on? Yeah. <laughs> um. So, a couple months ago, uh, my girlfriend and I were house hunting, and kind of found this house in the middle of the nowhere. It was it was a little little bit of beat up house. It was fine though. We were looking at it for a fixer upper, but we pull up and this deer kind of strolls up on us with a collar on too. It was very strange. Uh, deer kind of looked like maybe it had been sheltered because, in my opinion, it looked like it got hit in it by a car pretty slow and then became like that car owner's new pet to like shelter it back to. I don't know. But it's, it's like that deer is known to be in that area. Like people around that area love that deer. But 
it strolls up on us. My girlfriend being the wannabe Disney princess she is, was like, I'm going to go pet the deer. Walks over to the deer immediately. No, like, it would be the equivalent if you and I met, and before we even said anything, we just started hugging. Mm. She strolls up to it and starts to, she reaches out her hand to pet the deer on the head. The deer stands up on its back two legs and goes, whoom, and, like, tries to swing its front two legs at her, like, standing up. Look like, sort of like what the kangaroo equivalent of kicking would be. Okay. Anyway, and she takes a couple steps back and she's like, uh, and I actually have this on video. Um, and then she takes a couple steps back and is like, uh, deer stands up again after. So it goes boom, boom, couple, couple left, right, left, right, goes back down, comes back up with a little bit more of a forward angle now has maybe a little bit more malicious intent. And she, and my girlfriend starts booking it. She gets behind me at this point. I'm like yelling at the deer. It, It won't back down. Now it's like got its antlers pointed at me. So deer in front of me, girlfriend behind me, I've, I've got to, you know, I've got to do something. So I started to get into a little bit of a bladed stance, trying to keep my distance, you know, head back a little bit further than usual, not trying to get gored. My front foot, it, it, I have no choice. It comes towards me, antlers forwards, and I sidekicked it in the head. Not hard, but enough to like not get stabbed by eight pointy things. And I, it did the job because the deer, like a little stunned, I guess had never been kicked before. It was like, oh, oh. And then it just kind of like follows around. It follows us around for the rest of the day that we're looking at the house, but it, it didn't try me anymore. You passed the test. So that was good. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the best stories we've ever heard on this show. <laughs> uh, proof you know, I, that I, I, martial not... arts has application in un foreseen even bizarre circumstances Mm -hmm. well i mean you never know when you got to keep your distance you know just because it wasn't a human doesn't mean and i'm not all for kicking animals you know obviously it's not something you practice regularly it's it's not something i practice regularly but funny enough it is something i've thought about a lot like i have this huge fear of big cats and that one day I'm because I go walking a lot, so I'm always worried that like a big cat's just going to stroll up on me. Where are you? I don't know how. Where do you live? Uh, I am in North Carolina, okay. so like yeah. sometimes I'll go up to the mountains You've got in some Virginia. Big cats down there. Yeah, they're, they're around, so that's always in the back of my head. Like, okay, what am I going to do if a big cat strolls up on me? I what am what am I going to do? Am I going to outrun it? No. So I, I always my thought was sidekick down the throat. That's my only option. It's my only chance. So it, it, it kind of played out a little bit. I got a little bit of a test. You know, I didn't jump right to the big boss. I got to like play with it, see if it worked. So far, a little bit of success, but I'm still hoping I don't see the big cat. Okay. So given that you've thought about this quite a bit, what would you do differently now that you've kicked a deer in the head if you had to confront a big cat versus what you would have done perhaps before your altercation mm-hmm, mm-hmm. with eight pointy horns? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I would start wearing boots more often. Mm. Like boots that go up maybe even to the knee. Not like scandalous, but maybe useful boots that goes up to the knee. <laughs> not not like an eight-inch stiletto heel? <laughs> no, not okay. eight-inch heels okay. up to the knee boot. No, no, no. <laughs> I don't think those would help me much. But because Depends I, you know. The, the cat. That's true, too. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I think I think that would still be my move, the sidekick. And the reason for the boot is because in case they like bite or they latch on maybe to that leg, mm, I can That makes sense. You know, not immediately get torn to shreds. Um, but yeah, I think that would be the move still. I still feel pretty confident. Long, strong technique, pretty quick to just kind of jam down, you know, kind of just thwart whatever's happening. I hope it never comes to that. Oh yeah, me too, for sure. But you know what? If it does, I hope I get it on video. That's what's important. Yeah, so I, I'm curious how you're filming this this altercation with the deer. Oh, the deer the deer video stopped. So it started, I started recording because I was like, well, if she does pet this deer and everything uh, goes right, right, it's going to be really cute. I'm going to look like a good guy if I get it on video. Totally. And then as soon as it charged the second time, I had to stop recording. So the recording shuts off with me being like, hey, right beforehand you know, trying to like 
reason with the deer, I guess, was my thought process. Can you can you share that video with us? Yeah, of course. I'd love to put that in the show notes. Yeah, I'm sure I can. People be super popular. I, I can definitely find okay. it. That'd be great. Okay. So so we're covering martial arts and involvement and fighting and everything. <laughs> and and you know, let's go back. So you're in college and I'm assuming still dreaming of playing football? Uh, in undergrad, yes. Okay. And you had taken a break from training, at least more or less. And when did you connect, or regardless of time, when did you say, you know what? Football's not going to happen. Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I was probably about to start my junior year. So I had taken a whole bunch of college credits in high school and I, I was intent on getting my MBA within five years of starting college, like period. And then they dropped my grad school program that I was going to, they dropped the MBA program at my college that I was an undergrad for. Mm. So I had played two seasons worth of football. I was about to go into the spring of my sophomore year. They announced it over Christmas break. I'm like, oh, crap, what do I do now? Because I was about to graduate that that semester from undergrad. And I was like, uh, you know, let's be honest with myself. The position that I play, the people who go pro are like three to four inches taller than I am. I knew I wasn't going pro. So it was just a matter of how much longer did I want to enjoy playing. And at that point, I was like, well, I don't really enjoy playing in the first place. It was just kind of an honest uh, you know, conversation that I have with myself about how much more damage I wanted to take compared to how much fun I was having compared to how much I thought I would miss it in the future. And I was like, I would miss the games. I would miss my buddies. I wouldn't miss practice. And I would only miss it for two years. I might as well move forward and try and get my next degree. Mm. So yeah, I, I made what, what at the time felt like the smarter decision. I do miss, you know, having some of those years, but at the same time, it ended up working out. Okay. The way you're sharing that now, it sounds like it was an easy decision, but I'm I'm guessing it wasn't that trivial. I didn't have too much time to make it an easy or a hard decision. Oh. It was like they had announced it uh, maybe seven days before I had started school back up that semester. So I was like, huh, what am I going to do now? Well, guess i'll just stop playing football <laughs> mm. and which which means to me in the back of my head i'd always kind of thought about it not wanting to play anymore the, the reason that i still enjoyed it was because of the camaraderie and other than that i didn't really have a lot of incentive to play you know yeah makes sense i can wrap my head around that okay yeah so you're you're making this transition in your you know second half of undergrad mm -hmm. and you slowly step back into training or jump back in both feet. I'm down. Let's commit. Yeah. From what I remember, I had then moved to Texas to start grad school. I can't remember how quickly I got back into it. I think it started off by me playing rec league basketball. And I met a buddy of mine who is now in the UFC, funny enough, old Kennedy Nwushu. He, awesome guy. He's a huge, huge dude. He's like maybe 6'3", two, two, fights at 205. But we started talking about it while we were playing basketball. We became friends. And I was like, oh, I want to start training again. So I got into uh, – I started trying a different couple a couple different jujitsu places. I was like, oh, this is fun. So I did that for a couple months, and then they had kickboxing classes. So I was like, obviously, this is what I'm going to do more often. And I stopped doing jujitsu so much. <laughs> and um, – so I started doing that more often. And ever since then, for the most part, I had done more of a super broad kickboxing training than I had a karate training. Um, aside from a year or two when I moved back to Virginia and I got my third degree. But other than that, um, it was, yeah, it was a buddy of mine who I met who was fighting. And I was like, oh, yeah, I, I should, I could do this stuff again. I forgot how much I missed this. Did you, how do I want to say? It? So oftentimes kicks, oftentimes kickboxing is presented as 
martial arts, but maybe without some of the trappings of martial arts. Quite often, no uniforms, no rank, mm-hmm. uh, a bent towards fitness. Was yeah. this that sort of kickboxing? Um, it was more so like uh, kickboxing that was some mix between Muay Thai and Dutch style. Okay. So it was kickboxing with intent of maybe make of of making you a better striker. I think that's the best way I could word it because people were like doing competitions, but then there were also people who were just like there for fun. It was much more of like a recreational, like I want to play fight (laughs) rather than I want to burn some calories. Okay, I get you. Yeah. Did, Which is fun. Did the differences between that and what you had grown up with, were was that contrast enjoyable? Or did you find yourself missing what you had started with? Mm, to me, I've always had the most fun doing sparring and that kind of stuff in the first place. So that was sort of like the most of what I did enjoy, other than like the people that I knew back home, like my dad, obviously, right? Um. So that was the actual training, what they were training. I enjoyed a lot. It was difficult to get used to because of the difference in stance. Um, and I mean, obviously like the uniformity of, if that's a word of karate, like the, everybody standing in line, you know, shadow boxing punches, one, two, three, four, up to 10, you know, that was a little bit different because now we're like on a heavy bag and then we're shadow boxing and nobody's telling us what to do. And then we're like really repping out a hook punch for a full class. Mm. And I'm like, okay, uh, this is interesting. Cause I kind of had to jump back and forth based off schedule. Like I feel like everybody has to go through this where they have to take some beginner classes and they get to take some advanced classes when they move to a different area. But for the most part though, it was a whole lot of sparring and a whole lot of like free flowing stuff, which I felt like I could do well because I'd had so much of the basic techniques like super detail oriented karate stuff that I had. Makes sense. Okay. And what was next? Where, where did you go from, from there? Mm, From there, I was working at this place that like worked on kids, motor skill and development and it shut down. And so I had no job and I was, that's the moment where I was like, man, I wish I could just teach kids karate. So I looked around in different places, called up some karate places Karate is difficult to teach for somebody other than where you learned it yeah. because so many different styles of karate are unique and different and very rarely are those places even hiring in the first place. So it's kind of like just like cold calling martial arts schools and being like, hey, uh, I can teach what you teach, but just as good. Do you want to pay me for it? <laughs> so that was difficult. Uh, so from there, I started going uh, to like homeschool co-ops, daycares, uh, parks and rec departments, pretty much anywhere I could go that I didn't have to pay a a butt ton of rent and just started like slowly accumulating students and driving around a ton in the Dallas Fort Worth area and teaching kids that way. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. It was that, that was super fun uh, because it was the first like project that I had Mm that I didn't fail at, <laughs> like, oh. not like, not like fail, but you know, it was the first thing that I did on my own that like, nobody told me what to do. Nobody told me how to do it. Like in school, they're like, okay, here's the project. Here's the guidelines. Uh, here. Okay. Here's how much time you have. Here's who you reach out to. Here's how you cite stuff. No, I was just like, okay, I'm going to do my best to get people to sign up for karate. And that was the first thing I had like a taste of success in. So that felt really cool, but then also like super low profit margins. It was enjoyable because I got to make one schedule. It, it it was really like a really good first step for me to never want to work for anybody else ever again. <laughs> and just the way you phrase that, that it was the first thing you did kind of on your own that you didn't fail at. Mm-hmm. Should we read something into that? Is that how you look at things in your past um i think it was more so i was so worried about doing something that was completely on my own because there's so many things like as as you're growing up that are are pretty much just laid out for you 
and it would make sense that they worked. Like it, everything you do adds to a reason that it should definitely work. And when you don't have specific reasons that give you a, a sort of like a notification that ding, this is right. You know, that, um, that validation piece, that yeah, confirmation yeah, exactly. you're at least on the right path, if not in the right place. Right. So I had that fear of, you know, is what I'm doing going to work, you know? And, and I did have other things later on that like I, that didn't work out. So it, it was like that fear. And then I had a little bit of a taste of that, like where, so I had finally, or not even finally, cause I was still young, but I had had something that kind of made me not worry about that fear so much. So I immediately jumped all into it. And of course, people that may know you know you from some of the content that you put out. Mm -hmm. When did that start happening? Was, was that, was that soon after? How, uh, how did, let me ask the question I really mean to ask. Okay. Okay. People quite often will put content out in an effort to do something different from what they already do. You know, to have, mm -hmm. let's say, yeah. a second stream of income or, or a second job, right? Or you have an yeah, organization right. like us where the content that we put out is meant to be more of a marketing effort to let people know, hey, we do this these other things that, you know, yeah, the content's free and maybe you want to spend some money on some of these things that we do. Which, of course. Which one was your content effort? Hmm. Probably more so towards the second one. The first videos I made, which are private now, and people won't find, so <laughs> good luck. Good luck trying. Uh, were actually influenced by this YouTube page called Corridor Crew, uh, formerly Sam and Nico. They put out weekly, or uh, might even be bi-weekly, sort of like vlogs. Their, their bigger project was they made these like CGI short skits. Uh, but they put together vlogs of like behind the scenes stuff and how they made it and what their week was like and stuff like that. Uh, and that really motivated me to make these maybe like four or five videos of me teaching kids karate classes and all the cool fun parts to, you know, literally get people to sign up for karate. Okay. Like, and, and it was, they got maybe like two views a piece. And then I was like, that was cool. And then um, I had a big life change, which moved me to Virginia, and I stopped doing it for a bit. Actually, no. And then I moved to Instagram, where I started posting, like, pretty much any time somebody did something cool, I just tried to replicate it or, like, add a unique twist, which is where the bottle cap stuff started coming up. Um, but, yeah, the, the initial start of me on YouTube was, like, three to four videos of me just trying to market uh, – my kids karate classes that are sort of what like just made me really enjoy the video editing process. Mm, okay. But it not, not nearly what I thought they were going to be, but actually funny enough, I had a conversation with one of the guys who was in my, uh, oh, what class was it? I don't remember the class, but he used to sit next to me and I used to doodle like this idea of traveling around the world and taking different martial arts. And I, it was something I can't remember what I called it, but it was, it was sort of like a, it wasn't specifically the idea was for YouTube, but it was for like, you know, just kind of to document overall that whole experience of traveling around and take martial arts classes. And he reached out to me the other day. He was like, Seth, you're doing it. And I was like, what? He's like, you're doing exactly that thing that you said you want to do. That's so cool. I'm so proud of you. I was like, holy crap. I totally forgot. I even mentioned that. <laughs> wow. So it's cool how it worked out that way. It's interesting how, sometimes we get this idea and it's pretty deeply rooted and we forget about it consciously, but it's still there. We've, we've still put in the energy to that idea and it finds a way to happen. Yeah. Right. And I think it speaks to how much I've made my, like I've wanted to make my life around stuff that I enjoy. And what happens is that even after like, you know, things change, circumstances change, the thing that I enjoy is, the most still stayed the same. So the, I, in pursuit of that enjoyment, I still came up with the same answer. Hmm. What is the least enjoyable part of what's, let's call it the, the sensei Seth ecosystem. 
Hmm. The podcast. No, I, was, I knew you were going to say that. I, I've, I've already got you. I've got your sense of humor figured out, man. And you know what? It's because mine is the same. I'd say the exact same thing if this was reversed. Heck yeah. That's so funny. Um, I would say the least enjoyable thing. Hmm. The least enjoyable thing would have to be. It's, it's tough because it, it's actually a hard answer. I would say the least enjoyable thing are seeing the negative the negative stories that people have about martial arts when it comes to like you know them being duped over by people or or i was having a conversation earlier this morning with this this guy in my dms who was like i signed up for this school and i feel like they're hoodwinking me and there's not really much i can do about it um but that happens pretty rare and in between we get those Mm. too we get people who pop up and they'll you know, because we are a style agnostic, you know, general supporter of martial arts of overall. Course. And people come in by instructor X, you know, and fill mm-hmm. in the blank with some terrible thing, you know, either acutely or systemically. And yeah, sorry, I, we're, we're not we're not the martial arts police. We can't fix it. We can't change it. Um, yeah. Hopefully you'll try another school. Yeah. Know right. that this is not the norm that most people are good people. And I think overall martial artists are slightly better than the average, people, mm-hmm. average population. Yeah. I, I've put out videos for the purpose of hopefully nipping that in the butt where I've been like, here's some things to look out for if you're going to sign up for a school. And the guy who messaged me this morning just happened to have watched it after he signed up, mm-hmm. which is tough. Um, but at least I know that that means that there's some people who see it beforehand. But I would say the toughest part is the comments. Not because some of them rub me the wrong way, but because I see so many people who I know it might not affect me, but those people aren't just commenting on my stuff. You know, it's people who are like just super against the idea of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great way to put you it. And I know like... exactly the type of comments you mean when you say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just like uh, there's no optimism. There's no... Like, oh, that could have been a funny joke if I had gotten it. You know, that it's just people who are just in it to have a bad time. And I, I, I feel bad for them because I wish I could help them get it. But at the same time, the, the human in me wants to just fire back at them and roast them. So it's, it's a tough process. That's been one of the hardest parts about getting like into content creation was not being as cool as somebody like Sensei Endo, who is always nice to everybody. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. And this, and this is where guy. this is where I I want to make a joke at his expense, but he's a friend and a good friend. And yeah. I don't know that everyone listening would would pick up the sarcasm, so I'm not going to do it. But uh, oh well, now you have to. No, no. Ando's a good dude. Ando's a real good dude. And he, and he is. He is. He's in my experience. I mean, he's one of the people that pushes me, and I and I've told him that for years that when he mm-hmm. shows up, he shows up. At 100%. He does. And he drives me to produce better and better stuff. You know, when, when we talk about things as a team, you know, he's he's one of the ones that we look at. How how can we use what he's doing to improve what we're doing? Which I think is a yeah, very absolutely. martial arts mindset. It really is. Um, he's, he's one of the guys that I used to watch growing up when I was, had like that thought process of, oh, this is starting to become something that, you know, I watch these people on a regular basis way before I started making anything who were like in the back of my head of who should I try and be like, uh, if, if I want to start creating, um, who should I like take notes of? He was definitely one of those guys. He's an awesome dude. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, we, we've actually got something fun coming for one of our future episodes. I'm not going to give it away, but he's coming back on for, I don't know, third, fourth, fifth time or something. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah, great guy. Who else do you look up to? Hmm. Have you, uh, so the first thing that I think of, which seems like a little, um, maybe cocky a little bit, but the first thing I always think of whenever I hear that question is like uh, the Matthew McConaughey acceptance, the, the award speech. Uh, pretty much what he says is like, you know, I look up to myself in five years. Ooh, I and like, then yeah, I like he, that. Then he's like, five years later, if you ask me who I look up to, I would probably still say I look up to myself in five years. And what and what happens is the more 
that you think that way, like you're probably never going to reach everything you truly want to, but it makes it enjoyable and it makes you confident in yourself and all this stuff. I'd say probably the idea of what I can do, but obviously, you know, my father was a big one. My mother was a big one. Both these people who created nothing in martial arts, just having something that they really enjoyed and created something that sustains them and, you know, creates, uh, provides a home for a family and stuff like that. Uh, and then when it comes to content creation, you know, uh, Jesse and camp was one of the people that I used to watch yeah. all the time. Um, you know, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson's a big one. You know, I, I, I tried to base a lot of my training based off of him. I see Mike is one of the guys who first got me in the door. There's master Ken, there's grandmaster Jesse from Mexican martial arts is a huge one. There's so many really, really great creators For that sure. like I try and steal stuff from all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, again, that's, that is what martial arts is. You know, every style that's ever been put out has been a combination of styles that came before, techniques that came before. I'm going to take this from yeah, here absolutely. and this from here and this from there and end up with slightly something slightly different. And the people that you mentioned, we've had just about all of them on the show. So the audience, at least longtime listeners, are going to be familiar on some level with these folks. And if you go, you check out their video content and check out your content. Yeah, you can see some influence just as you could mm -hmm. in martial arts lineage but they're not the same. There are, yeah, right. there are things that you do better than those folks. There are things that, that they do better than you. And it's that constant push, that iteration of, okay, how do I improve my weaknesses that mm -hmm. not only does it bring you up, it brings everybody else who's who looking to you either as you know, they're, they're following you or maybe they're a, a friendly competitor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's so much stuff that like, we would go back and forth on and talk about like this thing that you did was really cool. I'm going to try, how did you do it? Cause I want to try stuff like it. And, and, and I, that's, ex you're exactly right. That's exactly what happens with martial arts. Like if somebody hit me with a spinning wheel kick and sparring and they did it a cool way, I'd be like, how did you do that? That was amazing. I want to do that to somebody else. Yeah. Kicking people's great. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Espe really especially is. in ways that they never saw coming. Oh, it's the best. It's one of my favorite. One things. of the coolest parts about being a karate kid that got into other styles of more vague kickboxing was the cool tricks and sparring with people who didn't know the cool tricks were coming. Yeah. And then you do them and they're like, what the heck was that? Yeah. That's the best. Yeah. I, I've, I've bounced around a little bit. So, you know, if I'm sparring with, with karate people, I might, you know, flip into more of a karate or taekwondo positioning mm -hmm. and, and vice yeah. versa. You know, just what are you expecting me to do? I'm going to do something completely different. I'm, yeah, I'm right. gonna I'm gonna turn front ways and 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 you know use my my little bit of kung fu experience. Or what's even better is when they ask you what you did and you tell them you tell them how to block it and then you do something that is completely different. <laughs> <laughs> when you knew they were gonna block a specific way. Oh. Yeah, yeah. That, same sense of humor. Yeah, we're we're there. We're on the same page. Wow. Well, we've talked a lot about the past present you know that mm -hmm. brings us up let's let's talk about the now let's talk about the future let's you know let's press fast forward on that figurative vcr or depending on how old you are uh you know something more I modern okay yeah, yeah all right <laughs> <laughs> what's coming if, if we get back in touch with you in five years you know reach out to five-year-older sensei seth your next influence inspiration mm -hmm. And say, hey, what's happened in the last five years? What would you hope he's going to tell us? Hmm. Here's what I'm thinking. I'm gonna I'm gonna buy a huge building, and on the front, it's the, my slogan's going to be "How to 100% Always Win a Fight." And what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly amass a large following of people who all agree with everything that I say, and it's going to, and and I'll call it something cool. I haven't thought of a name yet. Uh, and slowly but surely, they're going to do everything that I say. And we're not going to be a cult. So it's not a cult. Don't think it is. And they'll all pay me super large amounts of money and never disagree. I'll never get sued. And uh, yeah, I'll just live comfortably just doing that. <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> do it up. Sound awesome. <laughs> um, no, I think I think I want to start doing like seminar circuits it would be really cool once this whole thing opens back up. I'd love to do that and be able to go around and almost take as many as I teach. Like I'd love to really teach some stuff. I'd love to meet people who for whatever reason know who I am, which is a weird thing to say. Um, 
connect with people who have like minds with me. I, that's a better way to say that. I like that better. Um, uh, you know, obviously like being able to share my knowledge is really fun, but there's plenty of stuff that I don't know. So I'd love to be able to teach at seminars that I can also learn from other people. That would be a really fun thing to do. Travel around. I've never been outside the U S so like that's been one of my things is I want to make this something that I can travel around with yeah. and see new places, meet new people, all that fun stuff. Um, continue to make content. I'm going to say it right now. This is my goal, actually. Okay. And and if it happens in five years, I want you to share this with me and be like, hey, remember when you said this? I want to be on Disney Plus with a documentary of me traveling around the world, taking martial arts. Boom. Okay, that's it. Mic drop. Five years. Do it. Absolutely. I, I, Disney Plus. Here we yeah. go. <laughs> there is. We, we've talked about this a little bit on, on various episodes that the success of Cobra Kai, I cannot imagine doesn't have the other streaming platforms looking around saying, what content can we do that is going to fill that sort of niche on our platform? Yeah, right. Especially something that is lower cost. Heck, you should be able to produce what you're talking about for Mm -hmm. far less per episode than just about anything else. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Literally just pay for my travel costs, pay me a little bit, but pay for one maybe two cameramen that know what they're doing and can help me set up lighting and stuff. Yep. Heck I'll edit it. You probably don't want me to edit it, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> Dude. Oh my God. There's a lot, so there's fun. a lot of fun there. You know, something, it sounds similar to what Jesse's doing. Mm-hmm. Very similar. And also to what, uh, Oh man, what were their names? The, the big football player and the MMA fighter, uh, fight, fighter it wasn't fight quest. No, those guys? although actually very similar. <laughs> um, it was, uh, <laughs> gosh, what was their name? Fight. Oh, it's uh, I'm blanking. It's I'm good. sure a bunch of people are it's all good. yelling at me what the answer is. But there was a documentary or a series of videos on like the History Channel, I think, where these people go around and they take these oh, traditional martial arts. OK. And then they spar at the end with a Rings lot of them. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, it'd be it. very similar. So pretty much the only idea that I would be selling is that it would be newer, the production value would maybe be better, and then also hopefully people would watch to see me. Like it would be a, it would have to be a personality difference. Right. Right. And I think you have that. I think you could pull that off. Yeah, I think so too. I'm, I'm game. Disney Plus. Here we I'm, go. I'm I'm game to I don't know provide emotional support. Thank you. I appreciate that. That that's all that that's you know. That's all we can do. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> what do people want to get a hold of you? Where are they going to go? At Sensei underscore Seth on Instagram. Or if you wanted to, I don't know, hop on the YouTube comments. I reply to a lot of them. It is Sensei Seth. Couldn't make that much easier, could you? No. That's pretty easy. No. I like it. Okay. Well, this is your chance to, to close it up. We're going to record an outro later, but you know, what are your final words to the audience? Hmm. My final words to the audience is to not overthink martial arts and to have as much fun as you possibly can because in a lot of situations you won't even really need what you're doing i told you at the top that was going to be a fun one and wasn't it i had an absolutely great time talking with sensei seth what what a what a fun experience anytime we get other content producers on we we seem to be able to just kind of take a couple steps forward we can we can skip ahead a little bit and just get into the fun and that's not a a a dig at at non-content creating guests it's just a different experience anytime you put two people in a room even if it's figuratively you're going to get something different based on what they bring to the table and what i thought sensei seth brought to the table was really fun really entertaining not only do i completely understand even more now why so many people love the stuff that he puts out but I felt inspired, you know, right? I, I don't know if maybe you, maybe you felt it too. I hope you did. What a good guy. Sir, you are welcome back anytime you want to come on. What a blast. So make sure you check out his stuff as well as our stuff. You go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can see all the links and the content, the stuff that we've put up there from today's episode and all, honestly, all the other episodes that we do. So you can go deeper on this and, and connect with Sensei Seth. And if the work that we do here means something to you, don't forget, you've got a bunch of ways you can support us. You might consider buying one of our books on Amazon or telling someone about the show or even 
thrown a couple dollars our way via Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick. And don't forget, we designed this really cool strength and conditioning program for martial artists. And you can do it at home. It doesn't require any equipment. And it's far less expensive than you probably think it is. You can get it at whistlekickprograms.com. Use the code PODCAST15 to get 15% off that or anything else that we offer. And if you've got guest suggestions, I really do want to hear more topic suggestions. We'll, we'll take those too. We want to give you stuff that you want to hear and watch. Our social media account, we put a lot of work into it. It's at Whistlekick everywhere you can think of. And my personal email, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>